So welcome everybody. Sorry for starting a bit late, but we wanted to make sure that everybody uh, is seated. Minister de Gundos Jurado, um, distinguished guests, students, members of the press, and friends of LSE. My name is Waltraud Scheltle, and I'm pleased to be here today as a member of academic staff of LSE's European Institute to chair this afternoon's lecture. Today's event is part of the LSE's European uh, Institute and APCO Worldwide uh, Perspectives on Europe lecture series. We are very grateful to APCO for supporting uh, this series continuously. It is a great pleasure to welcome Luis de Cusino Jurado to the LSE this afternoon. The schedule is very tight and so I will keep my uh, remarks at uh, very brief. Luis de Guindos Jurado is uh, Spain's Minister of the Economy and Competitiveness, a position he has held since last year's election. Prior to this, he held senior positions both in the public and private sector. Between 2002 and 2004, he served as Secretary of State for Economic Affairs in which he was responsible for economic competition and financial policy. In this position, he attended the Eurogroup and ECOFIN meetings in the early years of the Euro. In respect to his private sector career, he has held senior positions comp in companies such as AB Aceros, Lehman Brothers, Nomura Securities, and PricewaterhouseCoopers. All of you in the room will be very aware uh, of the great challenges which Spain faces uh, economically. Today's lecture could not be more timely, and we look forward to what the minister has to say. The minister will talk for about 15 to 20 minutes, and there will be around 35 to 40 minutes for questions from you. Let me say one thing beforehand. LSE is extremely privileged that so many of the people we invite to speak on the campus accept our invitation. These events, including today's, provide an, an opportunity for visiting speakers to set out their thinking, but also provide LSE staff, students, and the general public uh, the opportunity to engage with and question our speakers in an academic setting, um, mindful of respecting other people's opinions and upholding the important principle of free speech, which it extends to politicians as well. Uh, it is important for the functioning of a university as a place of debate and discussion. As I indicated just a moment ago, there will be plenty of time for discussions at the end. For those Twitter uh, users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hash LSE Spain, the first four uh, capital letters. Please now join me in welcoming Luis de Guindes Jurado to LSE. His lecture is entitled Spain's Economic Policy Strategy. Thank you very much. Let me start, if I may, thanking uh, London School of, the London School of Economics and uh, Professor Circle for this presentation. It's a pleasure, it's a privilege to be here with you uh, this, uh, this evening to talk a little bit about the Spanish economy and the situation of the, of the, European, the European economy. Uh, we know perfectly that we are living uh, through difficult times, through complex uh, financial uh, situations, and I will try to to show you that uh, despite all the difficulties that uh, the Spanish economy is uh, now experiencing, despite all that, uh, that Spain is uh, a competitive and sustainable country. You will see that uh, you know, Spain, despite the imbalances that we are suffering, despite all the problems that now we, we, we have and that are important, deep and profound, well, we are able uh, we will be able to deal with these problems at, at the end of the day, as it, will, as it always has been in the past, we will be able to overcome all these uh, difficulties. I have prepared you know, a small presentation for you to underpin the comments that I want to make. I will make more comments on the previous situation of the Spanish economy, the economic policy strategy that uh, the government is implementing, and how we see that uh, you know, we can overcome these difficulties uh, in the near future. Also, I will refer afterwards to the situation of the, of the, of the Euroland, of the Eurozone, because uh, what happens to the Eurozone is going to be vital for the future and the performance of the Spanish economy. You cannot understand uh, uh, the Spanish economy without a clear reference with, to what is happening now in the Eurozone. You are fully aware that we have a sovereign debt crisis, this sovereign debt crisis has affected several countries, 
several countries in the periphery of Europe. And now, uh, perhaps you know, Spain is the focus of the attention about uh, many of the problems that uh, uh, the Eurozone is suffering. I would say even that uh, you know, the future of the battle of the Euro is going to be waged, you allow me to say, in Spain. Uh, I would like to start uh, remembering the main problems of the Spanish economy. Why the Spanish economy now uh, you know, is clearly uh, 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 underperforming the rest of our uh, Eurozone partners. And uh, you know, to, to understand uh, you know, the situation, we have to look backwards. And uh, you will see that we have accumulated three main imbalances in our economy. The first one was uh, you know, the private sector indebtedness. You can see how it was growing. In Spain, we had a, 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 you know, a credit bubble. And this credit bubble started uh, you know, in 2003 and was growing rapidly until 2008. So the first important problem of the Spanish economy is the level of leverage of the private sector, both households and non-financial corporations. If uh, we look a little bit uh, into, into the details of the numbers, what we'll, you will realize is that the bulk of uh, this uh, debt was accumulated by, re by real estate uh, corporations. And this goes to the second problem, to the second imbalance of the Spanish economy, that is the property bubble. You can see the evolution of prices, of nominal prices, and also in real terms. And you will notice that uh, you know, the bubble in Spain was second uh, uh, only to the Irish situation, that only in the case of Ireland, the evolution of prices was higher than in the case of Spain. And finally, the third imbalance uh, uh, accumulated uh, since the launching of the euro in Spain was a loss, an important loss of competitiveness until the year 2008. You know, this loss of competitiveness is something that you can assess, you can gauge, to, you can gauge uh, 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 both measured by the inflation rate differential or by unit labor costs. In that regard, since the launching of the euro in 1998 until the year 2008, for a full decade, Spain lost uh, a lot of competitiveness. The combination of these three imbalances with the financial crisis had uh, a polyedric effect on the Spanish economy. The first one was the deterioration of public finances. For many years, we believed that we had uh, you know, structural revenues linked to the property bubble that started to fade away once the bubble, the property bubble, uh, uh, burst. And you can see, you know, the evolution of the public deficit. We enter into the crisis in a good, uh, a very comfortable fiscal position with a surplus of 2% of GDP, with a, GDP, with a public debt ratio that was uh, a little bit more than 30%. It was quite comfortable because it was 20 full percentage points below the European average. But immediately, you can notice the deterioration, both cyclical and structural, that the Spanish uh, fiscal policy started to have. And you can see that uh, we went from a surplus of 2% in 2007 to a fiscal deficit of 11.2% two years afterwards. It was in part structural and in part cyclical. It was uh, the consequence of uh, you know, the interplay of the uh, automatic stabilizers of the fiscal policy, but also in those times Spain took wrong decisions on, in, fiscal, in fiscal policy. The second uh, consequence of uh, you know, the crisis in Spain, and perhaps you know, the most evident and the most painful uh, in social and political terms is the, the, the evolution of the labor market. No other country, not even the rescue countries, have had such, uh, have uh, suffered such a deterioration of the labor market as in Spain. You can see that the unemployment rate went from 8% in 2007 to something close to 25% nowadays. So this is uh, you know, the most evident uh, element and the most evident signal of the crisis that we are suffering in Spain. This has to do with the severity of the crisis, but also has to do with the regulation of the labor market that we had in Spain that penalizes uh, especially uh, uh, jobs and especially you know, people on shorter contracts that uh, especially the young population. And finally, you know, the third consequence of the crisis in Spain and the third manifest manifestation of the crisis is uh, the situation of the banks. Uh, when you have a credit bubble, when you have a property bubble, and these bubbles burst, immediately uh, the banks suffer. 
And in the case of Spain, you know, this was quite evident because the drop in the price of collateral and the contraction of trade uh, uh, started to happen, and this gave rise to a sort of vicious circle of trade contraction, trade deleverage, and simultaneously, you know, a worsening, a worsening uh, 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 economic situation. So, this is the diagnosis of the crisis in Spain, three imbalances, the financial crisis, and three manifestations of the crisis. The situation of the labor market, the public finances, and finally, the situation of the banks. Well, the economic policy strategy of the government is trying to, to address these imbalances and to try to correct you know, these problems that we have mentioned before. Uh, we have uh, tried to, to implement fiscal, fiscal discipline and a sustainable fiscal approach, and simultaneously to try to take advantage of the, of the strengths of the Spanish uh, economy. Uh, and in that regard, let me say that some of the imbalances that I have mentioned before and that were accumulated during the good years, now in the lean years, they have started to be corrected. So you can see here how you know, the private sector is deleveraging, is reducing the, 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 the weight of, the, of, the, of debt. You can see here that if we continue at the same pace uh, uh, in that uh, the private sector is uh, reducing uh, the, the, the level of debt, we will converge towards the European average in three, four years, that I think that is good news. And uh, this is good news in the sense that uh, you know, the process is, uh, you know, is more or less on track and that we are converging to the, to the European average. But also, the second element of the correction uh, is the situation of the public, public finances. Last year, Spain closed with a fiscal uh, deficit that uh, was very close to 9%. Uh, we do not have yet the final figures, but the final figures will be in the area of 9%. And you can see that uh, you know, the new government has uh, committed to a fiscal, uh, fiscal uh, path, uh, a, fisc a, consolidation, a fiscal consolidation path that is fully compatible with uh, you know, the sustainability and the medium-term sustainability of the public finances in Spain. We are committed with uh, a 6.3% percent uh, deficit for this year and to reduce further the deficit next year and to go to uh, you know, the level the, the, the below the threshold of 3% in, in 2014. And in this fiscal consolidation process, uh, you know, all the parts of the administration, all the different layers of the administration will have to make, uh, to make an effort. In Spain, we have adopted a strategy that uh, you know, tries uh, to take the bulk of the fiscal consolidation effort through a reduction of public expenditure. But also we have to raise taxes. We have raised uh, the income personal tax, we have raised the VAT, we have raised some environmental taxation, even we have uh, raised uh, you know, taxation on wealth, on property, on, on real estate property. This is uh, you know, the clear indication of the full commitment of the wholehearted effort that the Spanish government wants to put forward in terms of fiscal consolidation. This effort will have to be reflected on the, on the uh, uh, public debt GDP ratio. You can see here that uh, in Spain, as I have said before, we entered into the crisis with a very comfortable uh, public debt uh, ratio. It was 20 percentage points below the European average. Nevertheless, because uh, of the accumulation of, uh, of, uh, of public deficit, well, this public debt ratio is on the rise. You can see it here, but we are still uh, still clearly below the average. And uh, you know, the public debt ratio will be below the European average, despite the fact that the Spanish government has brought to the surface some commercial debt that was not acknowledged and that has been recognised finally, and now is part of the financial on the financial debt. And although, also, you will see here that we are taking into consideration the capital injection that is going to take place into the Spanish banks because of the lending of the EFSF, because of the banking program that Spain has signed with uh, its partners, and that uh, will amount something close to 40 billion euros. Nevertheless, and these are the good news, uh, the cost of finance of um, this public debt you know, is uh, very similar to the, to the, to the, to the, to the level of uh, last year. We have not seen, despite uh, the evolution of the yield spreads, an important or relevant increase in the cost of borrowing of the Spanish Treasury. 
It's very similar to what we've had uh, last year, and, and that's why uh, you know, the increase in the cost of servicing of the public debt of Spain is due mainly to the increase in the public, uh, in the public debt amount, much more than, uh, than coming from uh, you know, an increase in the financial costs of the issuance of debt. A very uh, relevant part of uh, the economic policy strategy of the Spanish economy is to deal with the banks and to recapitalize the banks and to clean up the banks. You, have, you know perfectly that there are uh, you know, many doubts about the situation of the banking industry. You know perfectly that uh, you know, there were uncertainties about uh, you know, the situation of the balance sheet of the Spanish banks. So the Spanish government, from the very beginning, applied uh, a twofold approach. The first one was to introduce all the clarity, to introduce all the transparency in the process. We have carried out a lot uh, of uh, checks from independent evaluators of the situation of the Spanish, of the Spanish banks and simultaneously to inject capital into the, into the banks. In that regard, uh, recently, uh, an independent evaluator, Oliver Wyman, finished a bottom-up approach to the, to, the, to the situation of the Spanish bank, and the conclusion was that 70% of the Spanish banks were quite clean, that we, they were able uh, to overcome a very severely stressed uh, negative scenario, and uh, that uh, you know the problems were concentrated uh, you know on 30% of the banking of the banking of the banking industry. All in all, what uh, you know the conclusion was that in this very stressed scenario, the capital shortfall of the Spanish banks will be in the will, would be in the area of 55 billion euros, and taking into consideration that uh, we will have other instruments to clean up the banks. At the end of the day, the final injection of capital will be close to 40 billion. That's only 4% of the Spanish GDP. But uh, I think that, uh, and this is a point that I would like to stress, and I think that this is quite uh, important, sometimes it's overlooked, is uh, you know, the competitiveness of the Spanish economy. This is something that, uh, you know, in my view, uh, well, and perhaps I am a little, bit a little bit biased, as you can imagine, uh, we should try uh, uh, to pay a little bit of more of attention, is uh, you know, the, the, the performance of the Spanish exports. If you look at the track record of the Spanish exports, it's really surprise, surprising. Spain is a quite a competitive economy. You can see here that uh, you know, Spain has a trade surplus with the rest of the Eurozone. We have a trade surplus with France. We have a trade surplus with, uh, with uh, Italy, a trade surplus with Austria. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, even uh, you know, this year, we will be able to close the external gap of the Spanish economy in terms of the current account deficit of the balance of payments. You know, this year is going to, we are going to be very close to zero. In the times of the peseta, uh, normally when the current account after a devaluation started to be corrected and close to balance, it was you know, the clear signal that the turning point was, was closed and that the Spanish economy was about starting to grow. And I think that uh, you know, this is something that uh, you know, is important to take into consideration. Now, we do not have the possibility of devaluating uh, or depreciating our currency because we live in the world of the Eurozone. But uh, Spain has uh, uh, implemented and carried out a wholehearted effort in order to, through internal devaluation, regain competitiveness. And this is something that you can see. So for instance, you know, I think that the data or the, 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 the piece of information that since 2001 this, the growth of the Spanish exports has been similar to the growth of German exports, I think that is something that is, uh, is, is, is worth considering. And also that uh, Spain has been the only country with Germany in the Eurozone that has been able to maintain its market share in, 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 in world trade. What's uh, the reason behind uh, you know, this uh, competitive situation of the Spanish economy? Well, the reason behind is very clear. is that, uh, well, we have started to reduce unit labor costs, and we have uh, gained competitiveness since 2008. I, th I have to say that uh, if you look at uh, unit labor costs, you can see the recovery since 2008. But I think that the recovery on the gain of competitiveness of the Spanish economy has taken place because of the wrong uh, avenue, if you allow me to say. Why? because uh, you know, the reduction in unit labor costs was produced through an important increase of productivity. But this increase in productivity was driven because the Spanish corporations uh, shed a lot of jobs and destroyed a lot of employment. This is the wrong way of proceeding. 
And that's why, you know, the labor market reform that we have implemented in, a, in a Spain tries to substitute this adjustment through quantities through an adjustment of the prices of labor. And I think that uh, you will see, and afterwards I will show you some data, that uh, you know, now we have much more wage moderation and that this simultaneously is limiting uh, and stabilizing the labor situation of the Spanish, of the Spanish market. Finally, let me say some words on, on uh, economic policy. Over the last nine months since the arrival of the new government, well, we have taken measures. Uh, you, can, uh, you, know, you can have different opinions about these, these measures, but I can tell you that uh, the idea was to fall. The first one was to stabilize the fiscal policy and to reduce the public deficit. This was totally inevitable. Uh, there, there, there was no alternative. We can discuss about the path of reduction of the deficit, how much are you going to tighten, but it was clear that we needed to tighten, because otherwise it was totally unsustainable for Spain to maintain a 9% deficit in the present circumstances of the world economy and the, the situation of the Eurozone. So that's uh, you know, the first pillar of the strategy. The second one was uh, the, the, the banking industry reform that I have told you, and we had to apply and to request a financial assistance program for our banks. And these financial assistance programs for our banks, well, uh, in the, over the next weeks, we will see how uh, we start to inject capital and we create a bad bank that will be uh, a powerful instrument to clean up the balance sheet of the banks. And finally, a structural reforms uh, in the supply side of the economy. The labor market reform is one of the examples, but also we have taken measures with respect to, to health, to education. We are going to liberalize further the, the, the professional services. We are going to, to eliminate uh, entry barriers in many markets. We will try to make Spain a much more uh, you know, attractive uh, uh, country for doing business. And I think that uh, you know, all the measures that we are taking in that regard uh, you know, will start to make uh, making a uh, you know, flexible economy. And finally, let me say you know, some words with respect to the Eurozone. I said at the beginning of my presentation that, uh, well, uh, uh, Spain is going to be strongly dependent on what happens to the situation of the Eurozone. Uh, here, what uh, you know, this chart shows is the, 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 the opinion of the IMF. According to the IMF, you know, now in the yield spread of Spain, there is a penalty of 200 basis points uh, produced because of the doubts about the euro. Yeah, I think that uh, you know, the possibility, this possibility, that is, I think that is crazy, of the euro falling apart is really penalizing some countries, and especially you know, the case of Spain, because we are the front runner in this race about the uncertainty of the future of the, of the, of the euro. So for Spain, in order to have a recovery, it's extremely important to dispel and to, uh, uh, and to uh, eliminate all the doubts about the future of the, of the euro. We cannot uh, accept that there is a redenomination risk in Spain for the currency, that uh, you know, there is a possibility that the euro will f fall apart. So that's why uh, I think that uh, you know, the OMT, the program of the ECB uh, to intervene in the secondary market, much more important than the concrete intervention in the secondary debt market uh, is the commitment of the uh, European institutions with the future of the Europe. That's why uh, Spain is going to support actively a banking union for the Eurozone, a fiscal union for the Euro Eurozone. We think that uh, we had some flaws in the initial uh, stages of the construction of the Euro that we have to correct. And this correction is especially you know, linked to the need of much more further economic policy integration. In that regard, uh, we feel that uh, uh, we are going to take all the correct steps over the next, uh, over the next months. I would not uh, 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 undervalue the political will of all the Eurozone members to maintain and to continue developing the project of the Eurozone. It's not only an economic and financial instrument, it's also a political instrument. It's extremely important for us. And I think that that's uh, you know, the reason why we will be able, at the end of the day, and despite all the difficulties that we have now, despite the recession that we are suffering now in Europe, despite the slowdown of the global economy, I think that at the end of the day, you know, the, the project of the euro will prevail for sure. In that regard, what I have to say is that Spain is going to play its part. We are going to try to do our homework. 
we are doing, I think, our homework. Uh, despite the difficulties, despite uh, you know, the sacrifices that we are asking to the Spanish population, but I think that there is only a way out, and this is the way of more Europe for Spain. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your speech, Minister. Um, we now open the floor to questions, and if you can let us know your name and affiliation, and wait for the roaming mic uh, before you start speaking. Please also bear in mind that this is your chance to ask one question and not to give a lecture of your own, so please keep your questions succinct. I will start with one as an example. Um, Spain has taken truly uh, harsh adjustment measures. Some people say it has even overdone, but this is not my question. So while Spain takes these austerity measures in anticipation that they think that this will, your government, that it, this will calm down markets, your national pride seems to be very hurt when member states in the European Union want to give you a bailout program but make these programs, so to speak, the conditionality for that support. So why is that? It has always puzzled me as a political economist why there is this discrepancy, the Irish have it too, that you accept those conditions of the market, but when it's uh, imposed on you politically, you reject uh, uh, that. What does that tell us about political integration in Europe? Well, I think that is a very good point. You know, I think that uh, uh, in the case of the Spanish government, uh, we are doing what we are doing because of our political conviction, because we think that is positive for Spain. We think that uh, you know, we, have, we have no alternative but uh, to reduce the public deficit with a public deficit of 9% and with a, uh, with a debt ratio that is uh, doubling in just uh, three years, you only can reduce the public deficit because otherwise public finances are going to be unsustainable. And simultaneously, you have to take into consideration that uh, you know, in the times that we uh, uh, increase our public deficit from a surplus of 2% to a deficit of 11%, the unemployment rate went from 8 to 21%. So, uh, uh, you know, there is not, uh, you know, uh, a clear connection between uh, fiscal expansion, fiscal stimuli, and uh, 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 the evolution of the labor of the labor of the labor market. That's why I think that we have to take a structural reform. That's again, this is because of our conviction. We know that the regulation of the labor market in Spain, you know, uh, plays against the young population. In Spain, we had uh, you know, more than 30% of the, of the labor force employed with short-term contracts. And the typical adjustment of a Spanish corporation when you have a reduction in demand is immediately to fire uh, the people with short-term contracts. But why would you be against this being imposed on you as a conditionality if your member states give you a guarantee for a rescue program? Why does your government say we do not accept a program that would make these measures a conditionality? But, uh, well, uh, but the Spain is doing that. You know, I think that uh, we have a full agreement with our partners that this is the correct way to behave. We have to reduce the public deficit according to a path that we have agreed with our partners. And simultaneously, we have to apply the structural reforms. But again, this is because of the situation of the Spanish economy. With respect to the potential bailout that you have mentioned, I think that uh, there is a little bit of misunderstanding. Spain does, doesn't need uh, a bailout at all. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Spain, 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 well, you know, what we have, you know, is a proposal from the ECB to trigger the intervention in the secondary market with certain conditions. And certain conditions that I understand perfectly, you know, the, the DCB is totally independent, but uh, they have demanded that in order to intervene in the secondary sovereign debt market, they want certain conditionality that are not going to be very far to the situation that we have now in Spain in terms of uh, the excessive deficit procedure or in terms of the European semester. I think that uh, you know that's not uh, the point uh, uh, at all. You know mm, what we are doing is what we think that is the correct thing for the future of the Spanish economy. And I have to say that in that regard, this is not only good for Spain, but it's going to be also good for the rest of the Eurozone. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll take questions. Um, the young man here with a white computer. 
Hi, um, Oliver Joyce, CNN. Um, I just wanted to know how are the regional elections in Spain coming up at the end of October and the elections in Catalonia in uh, November? How are these impacting on the Spanish government's debate over whether to accept a bailout? Well, I think that uh, you know, Spain, uh, the Spanish government is not taking into consideration any sort of electoral, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, situation mm, to uh, make a decision with respect uh, to the economic policy. Uh, uh, you know, the approach that we are uh, pursuing is much more based on the medium term of the Spanish economy. We, we are going to do what we believe that is the correct one. But, uh, you know, I think that short-term electoral events do not have any sort of implication now for, uh, you know, the implementation of this, the economic policy of, 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 of Spain. Uh, if we were, you know, in Spain we have a lot of regional, regional elections, they are important events, uh, regions are very important in Spain in terms of, uh, you know, administrative burden and in terms of uh, delivery of public services, but uh, uh, now, what I can assure you is that uh, you know, the outstanding uh, approach of the Spanish government is much more based on what is uh, you know, the medium term exit of the crisis right now. Thank you. Perhaps we take three uh, at a time. There is this lady over there who's just, yeah, with a dark shirt. And then I had somebody here with the glasses. And than you here. You had to earlier one today. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm Megan Green. I'm the Director of European Economics at Rubini Global Economics. And you mentioned that um, you know, Spain will, at the end of it, have to pump in about 40 billion euros into its banks to recapitalize them. And I guess I just compare this to 50 billion euros for the Greek banks and over 60 billion euros for the Irish banks. And I was just wondering if you could list for us some of the reasons why recapitalizing the Spanish banking sector is such a relative um, steal. And related to that, in terms of drawing a line under the banking crisis, if you could just talk a little bit about how Spain's bad bank will differ from NAMA, which some have argued um, hasn't turned out that well, that would be great. Then, young man here. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm still here doing master's degree at London School of Business and Finance. And I was wondering your attitude towards uh, this morning's decision of ECB, European Central Bank. And uh, the second, second question is, if I'm allowed to ask the second question, please. Only one. Yeah, okay, <laughs> then let's go for one question. Yeah. ECB, is your attention toward ECB's decision this morning? Thanks. Mike Gallagher from IDEA Global. Um, the IMF have published a special report ahead of uh, next week's IMF meeting, and they've looked at successful fiscal consolidations. Spain is doing the first part, which is to undertake structural reform and expenditure control. But the other two parts are positive growth, moderate inflation, and an export boom. How is Spain going to square the circle on these latter two? Okay. First of all, with respect to, to recapitalization of the of the of the of the banks. Well, I uh, I have. Um, underscored that uh, the strategy of the Spanish government has been to fault. First of all, the first part is to, to have clarity on the situation of the balance sheets. You know, many of the problems that we have had uh, with respect to the Spanish banking industry have to do with doubts, uncertainties, lack of clarity, uh, you know, opaque accounting in the balance sheet uh, of the banks. And we knew perfectly that in order to to, to, to create credibility, it was vital to introduce as much clarity as possible. I will tell you that, uh, for instance, in the case of Spain, the IMF, the FSAP exercise, took place with a top-down uh, stress test that gave rise to a capital shortfall of uh, close to 40 billion. Afterwards, two independent evaluators carried out also top-down uh, stress tests, uh, Oliver Wyman and, and Roland Berger, and the result was something between 50 and 60 billion of capital shortfall in a very stretched scenario. And afterwards, we carried out a bottom-up. Right? And a bottom-up is a much more granular, much more nitty-gritty approach in terms of analyzing the, the, the assets of the, of the banks. And, the, 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 and you can consult the results, uh, the hypotheses, the scenarios used by uh, you know, the independent evaluator in cooperation with ECB, with the Commission, with uh, 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 the IMF, 
And the conclusion was that uh, the Spanish banks, uh, you know, in this very extremely uh, uh, stressed negative scenario, will, uh, will require 55, 55 billion euros. Um, so uh, I think that uh, you know we have done whatever it takes in order to introduce this clarity. For sure that we could, you can look for more stress scenarios. But for instance, you know, in this uh, in this uh, in this exercise, you know, the timeline has been three years. That is not uh, usual in this kind of exercises. You know, normally, you know, they cover only two years. Well, in the case of Spain, uh, it has been three years. The drop in activity, drop in, in, in GDP, has been more than six percent. We have taken, you know, a string uh, hypothesis about the evolution of the of the real estate, uh, uh, both housing and uh, land. Well, I think that we have put forward, uh, you know, well, Oliver Wyman and, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the other institutions involved have put forward, I think, a, uh, you know, a scenario that I think that is credible. And the result is that, is that we will read something that is going to be close to something between 4 and 5 percent of the Spanish GDP, and that makes clear that uh, the problem of uh, the banking industry in Spain was encapsulated to 30% uh, of, the, of, the, of the balance sheet of the banks, of the, of the, of the assets of the banks, and that 70% of, of, the, of, the uh, of the total assets were able to resist and withhold this extreme uh, proof. Besides, uh, you know, well, we will carry out uh, the capital injection. We will create a bad bank to transfer uh, the toxic assets that will reduce the capital, the capital requirements of the, of the, of the, of the banks. The price that we are going to apply to, to these assets to be transferred to the bad bank will be extremely, extremely prudent, extremely cautious. And uh, you know, we are uh, convinced that we will be able to bring private investors to the, to, the, to the capital structure and to the equity of the bad bank. So all in all, well, uh, we are combining uh, transparency because we, I, 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 I really feel that we had, uh, you know, a problem of deficit of uh, credibility, and the only way to dispel that is with a lot of clarity, with a lot of transparency, with uh, the capital injection that we're going to carry out over the next weeks. At the end of the day, I hope that we will have, you know, a smaller banking industry with uh, few lenders, but much stronger than before, and that are in the condition of not being zombie banks, but uh, banks that, uh, you know, will be able to grant credit in the future. The second question was about the ECB. Hmm? Well, you know, I have uh, uh, full respect for the dependency of the ECB. I think that one of the great assets that we have in the Eurozone is that the ECB is a real independent bank. Uh, for sure that uh, you have discussions uh, about quantitative easing. Hmm? If uh, economic policy, uh, you know, if the uh, main element of economic policy were to monetize the deficit, then economic policy would be extremely, extremely easy. I think that uh, economic policy has to do with more things than monetizing the, the public deficit. That's why I fully respect the approach of the ECB, and I think that they are right. What I value about the position of the ECB vis-a-vis -vis the OMT, the new program of, uh, you know, for intervening in the secondary market, is not, to, is not the intervention per se in the secondary market. It's the commitment of the ECB that uh, you know, I was fully convinced that it, that was the situation with the future of the Eurozone. The ECB uh, said in, his, in its communique that uh, there was uh, an increasingly uh, deeper fragmentation of capital markets in Europe because there was the possibility of the euro falling apart and that he wanted to dispel that possibility. Uh, you know, this possibility was extremely detrimental to, to Spain because, uh, as I have said before, there was something in the area of 200, 250 basis points in our yield spread that is quite detrimental to uh, the Spanish Treasury and to the financing of the private sector in Spain that uh, were, were reflecting these doubts about the future of the Europe. So, uh, what I have to say is that uh, you know I fully support all the moves of the of the ECB. I think that they are doing the correct uh, they are taking the correct decisions, uh, and I think that they are fully committed with the future of the of the of the single currency. And at, at the end of the day, uh, the approach that they are applying 
that perhaps you know has raised some criticism because uh, you know they are not monetizing uh, uh, the public deficit. I think that is the correct one. And finally. Can you wait for asking the question? We have one more. Well, Spanish have no privilege over others. Please wait a minute. Wait. Can I, you have the chance to ask your question later, please. I just would like to give two answers to this question because I don't know how to apply this to health and public services and education and then the policy. Okay, the you made your point. People. The minister will. Okay, the minister will answer that question if you give him the chance. Okay, thank you. the chance to talk about the people. Please respect the freedom of speech here. We have heard your question. It is a good question. What happens to the social circumstances under these austerity programs? And the minister will answer that. But there was first another question about squaring the circle. You are allowed into this meeting Sorry, you are allowed into this meeting into, under the condition of that you do not disturb the meeting. So, as a, my first warning to you is now, as a chair of this meeting, I ask, I remind you that it is a policy of this school to allow freedom of speech, and I uh, ask you now to stop disturbing this meeting. You allowed. My second warning to you is: you are allowed into this meeting under the condition of not disturbing, to abide by the school's ground rules. A copy of which is displayed at the entrance of this meet of this uh, meeting. You are allowed to use either not allowed to use abusive language or disturb the meeting all the time. The third, so that, ladies and gentlemen over there, there are, there's a majority of people here who want to hear what the minister has to say. We will respond to that, but that is it. Okay? Thank you. So please go on. <laughs> Uh, if you want uh, to say me uh, something afterwards, what I can tell you is that I am totally open to take your views, and afterwards I am totally open to talk to you. Um, what I would uh, ask you, if you allow me to say, is that uh, you know I would like to, to reply to the question that have been put forward, that have been asked by other people. But uh, you know. Uh, if you want to talk to the Minister of Economy of Spain afterwards, I am totally open, totally open to take your views and to discuss with you and to try to understand your points. Because I hope that you understand that I am an open-minded person. So, uh, but, but please, let me continue with uh, you know, the debate with the rest of the audience. Well, to respect to the to the to the uh, to the IMF uh, question, I think that the IMF, uh, you know, there is a debate about uh, you know the interrelationship between fiscal tightening and, and growth, and I think that is an interesting debate. I think that uh, you know we have seen certain circumstances that uh, you know fiscal tightening does, has been rise to less growth, and this less growth has aggravated the situation of the fiscal finances, and so we are in a sort of vicious circle. This is something that we have to, to avoid. 
And the, the only way of doing that, the only way of doing that is uh, to uh, have measures to stimulate growth. And we think that we have to carry out the structural reform. Again, uh, uh, as I have told you, with respect to Spain, uh, you know, Spain has been a country that has suffered in terms of labor market uh, performance, the worst evolution, even much worse than in the case of Ireland, than in the case of Greece, than in the case of Portugal. So there is something in the labor market revolution, re, uh, regulation that I think that uh, you know, didn't work at all. That's why I think that the combination of fiscal consolidation at a uh, sensible path with a structural reform is going to be, is going to be an important uh, element in the strategy in the future. And that's the approach of the IMF also. We can go slightly over time because we started a bit late, so we'll up till 10 past. At the back over there, the man in the white shirt and a tie. Um, and the young person over there, I can't quite see who is, yes, has, the lady over there, exactly, with the long hair. She is next, and then we'll see. So wait for the mic and identify yourself, please. Yes. Yes? No, you, you, you are the one. Yeah. Well. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we had. Okay. One of you. <laughs> one of you. <laughs> so my name is Jeffrey Dolphin. Um, I am an LSE student and uh, in environmental economics. Uh, my question is related to um, youth unemployment in Spain. Um, so which is. The, the, the most crucial issue, I mean, one of the most crucial issues uh, for the recovery of the Spanish economy. And um, I think the, the, the just shake event we, uh, we, where the witness of just shows the frustration of a part of um, the population. So, um, how could, what, which measures could be, um, could be implemented to bring uh, young people back to work, which actually are the future of your country and of Europe's future. Um, so that's it. Because Thank you. The lady over there. Um, good evening. My name is Beatrice Martinez. Uh, I'm an LSE student uh, doing international political economy. You have mentioned how competitiveness is one of the priorities of your government uh, to improve the Spanish economy. Wouldn't you agree that uh, enhancing innovation and research and development are essential aspects of this, especially in the long term? And if so, how can you explain the drastic cuts in spending in these sectors? Thank you. Thank you. So why don't you take these two and then we'll see. Okay. <coughs> Well, uh, with respect to youth unemployment, I fully agree with you that uh, uh, youth unemployment is uh, the main drama now of the, Spanish, of the Spanish economy. And I have to say that uh, you, know, the, the, uh, you know, the bulk of the adjustment in the labor market has uh, taken place among the young people. Why? Because young people, they had uh, you know, uh, shorter contracts, temporary contracts that uh, it was uh, you know, the, 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 the escaping gate for the adjustment of the Spanish economy. The problem of the Spanish economy is that, uh, you know, in comparison with other countries, is that when you have the recession, immediately you know, the Spanish economy reacts through shedding jobs and through shedding uh, the jobs of the, young, of the young population. Why? Because it's extremely easy because the filing costs uh, of these shorter contracts was, were very, very, very low, whereas uh, you have other, other groups, other segments with much higher, much higher costs of filing. <coughs> and simultaneously, because the wage bargaining process didn't allow flexibility in terms of uh, you know, wage moderation. You know, if you look, for instance, at Germany, in the case of Germany, for instance, uh, well, the adjustment to a drop in activity took place through wage moderation. That's not the place in Spain. And it's not a much better way of adjusting to the situation. That's why the new labor market reform that we have uh, approved in Spain looks to give prevalence at the wage bargaining process at the corporate level so that uh, the conditions were not, uh, were, 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 were not imposed from uh, you know, the sectoral or the national level that do not take into consideration 
the concrete circumstances of the corporations. So decentralizing the wage bargaining process, I think that is going to be an important step to modify the traditional dynamics of the Spanish labor market. The second question was with respect to research and development. Well, what I have to say is that uh, you know, the public expenditure in research, in the, uh, research and development is the only item that has not suffered a reduction in next year's budget. Uh, well, it's something that you can check. It's in the budget that we approved. And uh, you know, that we are going to maintain the expenditure in research and development. We fully agree that this is one of the levers of growth, for growth. And uh, for sure that, uh, well, uh, you know, we want to prioritize, as in the case of education, the expenditure, the public expenditure in research and development. And this has been the, the only, well, the only with education, the only item that has not suffered a reduction in a very difficult budget that we have to approve for next year. Well, if you were... If you want, uh, if you want, uh, I can send you all the all the details, and we are open to send you the details. But it has been published that uh, you know in the 2030 draft budget, research and development didn't suffer any cut, any reduction. At the very end, over there, somebody has an urgent question. That's the last one we we have time for. I'm afraid. <laughs> Make a run. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to London. Your name and affiliation, please. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of public. I, I study here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but thank you, thank you. For, it was a free event, so it was a good chance. Um, thank you, first of all, for coming to London and give us, uh, the Spanish people, to, to have the chance to, to talk to you in person. I think it's a good, uh, it's a good opportunity for all of us. Um, also, as well, to, 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 to come Could here. Could you ask a question, please? We are at the end of time. Oh, okay. Um, you said at the beginning of the conference that the, the, the reason of the Spanish situation, the economic situation, was because of the private sector indebtedness, uh, housing bubble, and loss of uh, com competitiveness. Um, two of those three are the private sector, um, but is the public sector which is paying for that? Uh, is the public sector which is reducing? And is the private sector in Spain which is increasing? So um, I would like to, to know your views on that because I don't understand why the people that is causing all the troubles in our country uh, and all the problems is the private sector and we are supporting them and we are, uh, and the public and the people is taking the blame, and you are um, freezing the pensions, and you are lowering the job seekers allowance, you are doing cuts in education and health, and it's true that you didn't do cuts on, on investigation, but as far as I'm aware, it was science that's not gonna get, uh, is the cut in science. Thank you, so it is an important question, but let's now get the answer, thank you. Okay, but thank you very much, cheers. <laughs> well, uh, I have to say again, uh, you know, that uh, uh, sometimes uh, governments have to take unpopular decisions. And uh, I fully understand, you know, sometimes the discouragement, if you allow me to say, of the population because of these measures. But, uh, you know, uh, these measures, uh, we believe, that are totally necessary to put Spain on a stable situation to recover growth in the future. What we are doing is, uh, well, is something that, uh, you know, uh, any government uh, does not want to do. But, uh, you know, we are fully convinced that we do not have other alternative, taking into consideration that the public deficit of Spain was extremely high. Well, uh, you know, it was cost, uh, you know, but uh, I, I, I prefer to look forward because if I look backwards, <laughs> because I have, I have to look for solutions. The government has to look for solutions. We have to learn. You have not answered the question. 
Well, I'm trying to, to answer the question, okay? He asked why we are paying the public sector, why we are charging with the burden of the, of the private sector. And what all that you are saying is that you are taking the measures and so on and all the same things. But, I mean, there, there is no clear answer there. Well, in European, perhaps there is no clear answer. You know, you allow me at least the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps, you know, I have an answer, you know. You know, let me have, you know. I, 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 I share your views that perhaps, you know, I cannot convince you. Let me try to convince the rest of the population. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the problem, the problem, as I have told you, you know, it was, uh, you know, the, the over indebtedness of the of the of the private sector, and we know perfectly that we made, uh, you know, uh, the whole Spanish situation when you analyze that the private sector made some mistakes. I fully agree. I have recognized that. Eh? But uh, we have to do is to look forward, to avoid uh, uh, repeating the mistakes that we made in the past, and to correct the imbalances of the Spanish economy to try to create the conditions for growth and for employment. If I start to look backwards, perhaps, you know, we will miss the possibilities of recovering the, of the Spanish economy. I will not forget about the past, and I think that we should not forget about the past. But what I can tell you is that we have to take the measures that sometimes are very painful to try to have the Spanish economy growing again. And this is the main intention of the, of the, of the, of the government. Also, in the, in, the, in, the, in the public sector, there were mistakes. Many, many, in many areas, we made mistakes. But if we start that we are focused only on the mistakes, what I can assure you is that we will not be able to, to look and to find an avenue, an avenue for leaving behind the crisis. Those are no mistakes, but it is a Ladies and gentlemen, you will get the opportunity. The minister. We, we have now we have now to bring that meeting to a close. Ladies and gentlemen, before I thank the minister, I would like to ask you to wait uh, until I can escort him out of the, the room. Um, it has been a great pleasure to you and very stimulating to have to discuss with you. And I think for all of us it has been extremely interesting to discuss with Minister de Guindos and to engage with him on these very important issues. We are most grateful that you could find time and be with us.